So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kurt Fishback. Although in chatting with people before the, the uh, program, I think may, most of you know Kurt. So, but let me, let me run through his bio just in case you didn't know some things like I learned some things. Um, so he, uh, his full name is Kurt Edward Fishback. He's the son of Glenn Fishback and namesake of photographer Edmund Weston. He grew up as part of the photographic community in Northern California during the 40s and 50s. Mentors and friends of the family included Ansel Adams, Wynne Bullock, and Edward Weston. Despite his immersion into the world of photography, and this is the surprise, I thought, he began his artistic career studying ceramic sculpture at Sacramento City College, the San Francisco Art Institute, and the University of California, Davis in the 60s. He first began to experiment personally with photography in 1962 as a way to document his experiences with other sculptors. But it was not until his father invited him to teach at the Glenn Fishback School of <coughs> Photography that photography became his main artistic expression. Since then, he has gathered over 300 environmental portraits of artists in their studios or other personal spaces <coughs> since 1979. And a personal note here, he's photographed me in my studio. Not only was the product wonderful, but the experience was terrific. He's got a great sense of peace about him and a great aura. Um, and he now mentors other artists. Hopefully part of that mentoring process is how to, to be calm and how to make your subjects calm and relaxed. Uh, just one more uh, note, he had his first two major one-person exhibitions were held at the Crocker Art Museum in 1981 and SF MoMA in 1983. So with that, Kurt. I get to sit down. I get to sit down too. Can you hear me? I think the mic is uh, still muted. Is that better? Yeah. OK, good. Let me take a sip of water, wet the whistle. Uh, a thought came to me this morning about how to lead this talk off. I mean, this is about a few of my favorite things. Uh, if you make art for s over 60 years, uh, you've got a few things to talk about. And the one thing that came to me is that uh, I love what I do, and I've been doing it for that long. This print, uh, this photograph my dad made of my mother in 1937, the year they got married, <clears throat> on the dunes at, at Oceano. And uh, uh, it, it, it began my, my trip and learning that black and white photography is the best way to see light. Sixth grade, Howe Avenue School, and uh, the eye is my sister's, and uh, I had a little camera, and I made this photograph. So uh, I started early. 10 years old, I was a clown for the day at uh, the uh, Shrine Circus at the Memorial Auditorium. My dad did a number of things with them, but uh, I got to perform, and they thought I was a midget. <laughs> when I was a senior in high school, I made this painting uh, from a, a photograph that I found in, in a Life magazine of, and this is 1959, uh, of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and his, and his people. Uh, in Selma, Alabama, and I made a painting of it, and I won the gold medal at the National Scholastic Art Awards contest. And, you know, it seemed prophetic to me that I would win it for that. It felt good. This is my dad, 1962. I asked him to teach me photography. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Basically, he's waiting here for uh, an architect that designed this school in the north area uh, to come shoot an environmental portrait of him for a brochure that he was doing. And uh, 62 as well, I went to New York, art in New York with Wayne Tebow. 
I got to go and walk around New York and uh, also was at his first opening at Allen Stone Gallery. But I made this photograph uh, of the uh, Guggenheim Museum. This is my grandmother, Grandma B. She lived to be 100. She taught me carpentry. She taught me how to be a man. She also taught me that uh, uh, cow pie out in the field, if you left it alone and uh, let it dry out, it'd be good fuel for your fire. But if you stirred it up with a stick, it was going to stink. <laughs> Belmonte Gallery. This is, anybody remember Larry Weldon? This is his daughter. And many years later, I did her wedding in the early, in the early 80s <clears throat> when she got married. But they did kids drawing classes at the Belmonte Gallery. I also went there on Wednesday nights uh, to draw because at City College, they didn't have nude models. They were very pragmatic and Victorian about it and didn't have real nude models. And they did. It cost me six bucks a week. And, I learned to draw. And I also got to draw this woman from early pregnancy, through pregnancy, and after pregnancy, which was fascinating. This painting won me a second place in painting at the Kingsley Annual 1963. <laughs> so, so I have a history with the Kingsley Club. 1964, I went to the Art Institute in San Francisco. I was an a potter at that point, working for Taylor and Ng Ceramics in San Francisco, wedging clay and firing stuff. And uh, basically, uh, Jim Melchert and Ron Nagel taught me how to make art with clay as opposed to pottery. Now, I don't, I'm not denigrating pottery, because I think pottery is amazing. But they taught me to make things with clay other than that. And I wound up from that point to this, uh, painting on my ceramic sculpture as opposed to glazing it, because the kilns were falling apart. And when you did a glaze fire, there were bits of kiln wash and so forth in your glaze. And so I, I got a bunch of uh, Dutch boy enamels. And uh, the ones painted with those enamels still look good. 65, um, my aunt was working in the embassy in Cairo, Egypt. And she said, you want to come to Egypt? And I said, yeah, of course. So I took off and I went there. And I photographed in the street. Now, mind you, you're only going to see samples of things. I made many photographs in the street. I learned to uh, love Muslim people. Considering what's going on in the world right now, it saddens me deeply. Because they are, except for a few crazy people, they are caring, loving people that, that it, it was just an amazing experience. The fellow on, the, on our left was the bow up of the, he pumped the water up under the roof of my aunt's apartment in Cairo so that you could take a shower. And his friend was a Muslim cleric. And just as I went to make this photograph, the woman stuck her face in the window. So I had one chance. On the way home, my uncle was an executive with IBM at the time. And uh, it was the New York World's Fair going on. And so he says, why don't we go to the uh, IBM exhibit and, uh, <clears throat> and take a look? So we went, and I took my camera. I pointed it at this group of people. It's a bleachers that wound up rising into a dome, a cement dome. And amazing story, uh, exhibition of slides, you know, a bunch of color slide projectors. <laughs> Nothing digital at that point to speak of. And this same exact image with different people in it wound up on the cover of Newsweek magazine by another photographer. So universal ideas. This is me and Dave Gilhooly in 1967, 66, uh, 67. We put on the first group mess at the Belmonte Gallery in Oak Park. Uh, so I have a lot of history with the Belmonte Gallery as well. And basically, we asked people like William Wiley and Bill Allen and Ron, you know, various other people uh, to make a piece that they'd always wanted to make, but they couldn't make it for one reason or another. Went back to the Art Institute to finish off my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. And uh, I found a book on, a 19th century book on dairy farming. 
And what you see on the, this is morning milk. That's an antique milking machine. So I thought in the Dada surrealist approach, let's just stick a, a, an arbitrary milking machine in various situations. This is milker of my eye, and this wound up being in a permanent collection uh, in New York. I did drawings as well. We found a place where we could buy 30 by 40 paper cheap, and we bought a big ream and then split it up. And this is Sunday afternoon in the bathtub. <laughs> because of politics, I didn't go to UC Davis right away, because I already had a relationship with Bob Arneson. I was showing with him and Dave Gilhooly and other people with my ceramic sculpture. But uh, they were trying to get an MFA program at UC Davis. And they told me I wasn't broadly enough educated with a BFA from the Art Institute in San Francisco in three years at Sac City College, which I thought was bullshit. You know? And so I applied at Cornell University. And Jim Dine was supposed to be running the art department. I thought, oh, wow. And Bob Arneson told me, go to, go to Cornell. And I got a full ride. But they didn't have ceramics. So I used wood and fiberglass. This is a six by eight foot mummified cloud. <laughs> OK, and I made a mold. So out of the same mold came a cellophane wrapped sky. The house on the left was Maya, and I'll just say it all. Maya, Gregaris, Zach, Peoples, Bright. OK? That was her house, and I helped paint it, the, the rainbow house. And so I made the sculpture on the right out of fiberglass and wood, painted with an airbrush and brushes. and so forth. It's all fiberglass and wood. It's 14 feet tall to honor that. When I came back to Davis, uh, this is William Wiley lying in the bushes in the reeds. Uh, I remember one of the students says, I want you to all show up at this wild wheat field. And we're going to find the installations in the field and trim around them. So bring something to cut grass with or weeds or something. And so I brought my camera. Uh, and uh, I was taking pictures, and Wiley posed for me. And the gal with the sickle on her hand, on her, on her arm, didn't know I, she was in the picture. And I made ceramic sculpture out of uh, cliches about home. This is inside out house. Homemade cookies. That's, a, of course, a drawing of the homemade cookies idea. And ideas are to be used. 74, I found myself teaching at my dad's school of photography. And uh, I got a Pentax 67 and went to North Beach and did an essay on, on. And I should point out that street photography is all existing light. You go with whatever light you have, and you work with that. No, you don't carry a flash or anything like that. I mean, you can't be a very good ninja if you're using a flash. And I mean, I'm. This is a wide angle lens. I'm standing probably five feet from this guy, taking this photograph with a topless waitress and the so forth. And I'm still making ceramic sculpture in the 70s. They, I wound up being asked to be in shows through the 70s. And I think the last time uh, prominently was 1980, I got asked to be in a show. But this is a half cupcake. And a vegetable plate. 79, uh, my dad had died, and um, my mother and I decided to stay friends and not work together. Anybody ever work in a family-run business? OK. We, I love my mother, but she didn't see me as having a future with the School of Photography. So I, I opened a commercial photography studio in Sacramento. And I had a friend. Uh, Carol Hill was her name. She was one of the last paramours of Henry Miller, the, the author. She lived in, uh, near Carmel. And uh, she says, oh, I've got this fellow you should photograph. And uh, uh, his name was Edmund Cara. He's on the cover of the book that Tower Books uh, and Records created. Uh, uh, and uh, he's a woodcarver. He's a big sir. He lived on a cliff above the ocean. 
Amazing fellow. Guess who? I was hired to do Jerry Brown's official portrait in 1979. And I said, I'll do it if I can do an environmental portrait of him, something with his environment to, to help define him. And behind him is a big bowl of popcorn and some junk food. He was a junk food addict. And uh, he asked the most intelligent questions of any politician I've ever known. And I did a lot of politicians. And the way they got him to smile was uh, by telling, this is Gray Davis, who was his chief of staff at the time. Uh, you know, got him to uh, smile by telling deep tongue kissing stories with Linda Ronstadt. <laughs> so in 79, I went over to see Bob Arneson. I hadn't really seen him in eight or nine years with going through my dad's school and teaching there for a period of time. And I made this photograph of him on his wedging table. Then in 85, I did, did another portrait of him. And this, this is part of the series uh, that was, the first one was in the show at the Crocker in 81. But this, uh, I think, is one of my, probably one of my favorite portraits. Wayne Tebow, also in 70, uh, 80, actually, 1980, at his studio in, uh, at UC Davis. Then I did a new one of him in 1997. And, you know, Good artists are always approachable and available. That's the thing that I really like about it. But I started doing the artist portraits for the purpose of showing the public what the artists look like and what their environments look like. Because most of the time, we know what the art looks like, but we don't know the artist. This is Ansel Adams. And there's a long story here that uh, you know spans technical stuff about the print above him and blah, blah, blah. But the important thing is that we he and we got to talking about exposure control, which you know the new cell phones do rather well, unfortunately, <laughs> for me as a commercial photographer. <laughs> but he says, follow me. And he went to this back room with a big bay window. And he pointed. He says, do you see that, that conifer at the back of the property? And I said, yes. He said, look back under the branches. And I looked. And it was very dark back under the branches. He said, there's light there. And then I was teaching later at uh, American River College for about 21 years, part time. And I wrote that, those three words on the board in an intermediate uh, 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 black and white class. And we explored what that meant. There's light there. 82, uh, I was doing all of Weinstock's product photography, built out, well, a lot of money. <laughs> and that was nice. And so we went, to, I shot ahead for them, and then we went to New York and uh, spent the month of May in New York making <coughs> portraits of artists in New York. 44 portraits in 21 days. And the only way I could have done that is existing light, if you think about it. This is Chuck Close. And Chuck, uh, when he met us at the door, my late wife Joan and I, he says, I want to apologize for how rude I was on the phone. But he said, I had the worst case of hemorrhoids I've ever had in my life. <laughs> this is Eve Sonneman. And Eve, Eve's studio was being uh, renovated and so forth. So she, she couldn't uh, be in her studio. She says, let's do it in front of the entrance to the Brooklyn Bridge. He says, says I really love that bridge. So, so she came out and she held her camera up. And I did street photography, right? Robert Mapplethorpe, what a gentleman. I'll just say that flat out, because later on, uh, uh, Michael Himovitz had a show at his early gallery uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Fair Oaks, or, or uh, Carmichael, rather, when he had it in Carmichael. And uh, <clears throat> he had a piece of my portrait and then a piece of the person's art. And I called Robert on the phone, and he says, sure, I'll send you a print. And he had his gallery send me a print. And he, when I got done photographing him, the great poser, um, he says, would you like to see what I'm working on? And I said, oh, yeah. He spent two hours looking at study, you know, uh, study prints that he was doing for a book called Lady 
They were all nudes of Lisa Lyons, who was the world's champion uh, woman bodybuilder at the time, before steroids, before they looked like those action dolls. This is Michael Himovitz. At his gallery and at Carmichael, we had a show of nudes. Uh, mother, daughter, mother, father, and children. And I actually did uh, babies, uh, six-month-old babies at uh, daycare centers with the agreement of their parents and gave them prints and so forth. If I tried to do that now, I'd probably wind up in jail as a, as a pedophile. Isn't that sad? I mean, that's really sad. And I sold one of the baby ones to uh, Mercy Healthcare for their obstetrics program, ID. And they made an, a big uh, uh, embossed thing out of it. It was quite beautiful. But Michael uh, also helped me put together a, uh, uh, a lead, a, uh, an intro to a, a limited edition portfolio of the New York portraits. 60, in 84, I wound up teaching at Weber State University in Ogden, Utah. And uh, we, had, we invited Greg McGregor from Oakland to come and be a visiting artist. And we put on the first bad art conference. <laughs> he and I sat on one night you know, over six pack and thought, what should we do? Well, let's do the, the sign says bad art conference, and it gives the date about about uh, uh, 1986, 87. And he is known for making small explosions in the desert. He was at that time, and then photographing them with black powder. And what we did on that hill is dig a hole about a foot and a half deep and fill it with a big blast, a big uh, uh, pipe cap, cast iron pipe cap, uh, full of black powder, and then filled it with dirt and piled bad art donated by students, and <laughs> blew it sky high. Then that afternoon, we went to uh, uh, near Huntsville, which is over the mountains from Ogden. And uh, he put black powder in the hat that he found at Deseret Industries <laughs> and blew his hat off. And I'm still making ceramic sculpture. And this is, this is later on. Anybody figure out what the title of this is? Portrait of the Artist, Handling a Problem with Ease. <laughs> and Ron, Ron Peets owns this one now. 2004, I uh, got an idea at a wonderful student, uh, ex-student who from American River College who was teaching elementary school. And she arranged for us to photograph a second grade class. All we asked him to do is make faces. And five of these, thanks to Susan Willoughby, because uh, she's the curator at the UC Davis Med Center, five of them are hanging in the children's oncology wing <laughs> to give them a cheer, to, to make them laugh when they go there. This is, uh, let me think, about 2007, I believe, this happened. And it was at the Barton Gallery. And I did, did Earth-based stuff. So this is. Uh, uh, continental Divide. And this is Earthbound. And uh, Russ, uh, Michael Solomon owns this one. And I was pushed by commercial clients into the digital world about 2004, 2005. I had done the annual report for a corporation uh, for four years, and they didn't call me that, that fall. And I thought, what's going on? You know, Why aren't you calling me? Because it was a good, good gig. And uh, so I called them, and they said, well, sorry. I, I called them, and I said, what's going on? And she said, well, you don't own a digital camera, so we hired somebody else. So that's the, how fickle the commercial world was. And I experimented with photographs of ravens and obviously starfish and, and Photoshop. And I fell in love with ravens off the Mendocino headlands. Anybody know the Mendocino headlands? Oh, amazing, because they'll fly right opposite you. And, and you know, this is a great story, but I've got to keep this to 45 minutes. <laughs> this is my new wife, Cassie. Uh, and this is 2007. Uh, got a grant from SMAC to do a new show at Sac City College, the Gregory Condos Gallery. 
and I did 24 new portraits of artists, both color and black and white. I thought, well, I'll succumb and because I was doing digital. When you shoot digital, you wind up with a color file and then you turn it into black and white. That's where the dark room happens, the digital dark room happens. So I photographed her and I photographed a dear friend who is now a Tibetan Buddhist Geshe, Geshe uh, Labsang Sutram. And uh, he, uh, I told him about, I mean, his robes are this beautiful color of red, kind of like these front your seats you're in. And uh, he says, no, no, you, your art is black and white. Shoot it in black and white. And that painting above him is a Tonka painting. Do you know about Tonka paintings? They're painted to very specific uh, rules about proportion and all that kind of thing of the Buddha. And uh, I took his class, taught, learned how to do Tonka painting. So I did him in black and white. He's a delightful man. And this is a friend I lost two and a half weeks ago. Uh, he was a student of mine at my dad's school of photography in the 70s. And he succumbed to leukemia uh, two and a half weeks ago. And uh, called me, he, his wife called me the day we left for Fort Bragg for the tr last trip we made. Well, Bob, you're here. <laughs> When Tony Natsoulis was curating for the Blue Line Gallery, he called me and he says, uh, I want you to do a plate to hang on the wall. So I thought, well, what would a breakfast plate look like hanging on the wall? <laughs> it's all painted ceramic. And then uh, 2000, I believe it's 2013, uh, I had a two-person show with my wife, Cassie, and I did drawings and I, draw I got out a lot of the vintage ceramic stuff that I had. And this is more of the uh, uh, home, house home cliches and so forth. And uh, this is homemade pie. <laughs> Inside outhouse. This is Jim Melcher. Jim Melcher was my teacher at the Art Institute. He was one of the most delightful, wonderful men I've ever known in my life. He taught me that direction is the ability to accept and reject ideas without having to try them physically in art. And he taught me to have direction. I was kind of lost when I first went to the Art Institute. I mean, it was in the, you know, in, this, in the 60s. It's, wow. Uh, and he also told me another wonderful axiom was that you should take an idea and dig a well on it as opposed to plowing a field. Because if you dig a well, you can see where you're going and you can see where you've been. But if you plow a field, you get lost over the horizon somewhere, the, what you've already done. And so I did this of him in 2017, I believe. I recognize uh, later that my archive was not balanced in terms of gender. And about 2015, I began doing portraits to rectify that. And I wound up doing 71 portraits. That took me uh, about two and a half years. And I showed them at Pence Gallery in Davis. And then had a, had a gallery talk by the women, by five women. I didn't, I didn't get to say a word. But that was the point of the show and the point of the project. And this is my wife, Cassie. And I asked her, as I do, as I have all the artists pretty much that I photographed, I asked her, Where, where's your environment? Where do you want to be? And this is the middle fork of the Yuba River. Isn't it, Cassie? I believe it's the middle fork. And uh, she's, that's with her medicine blanket and other accoutrements of Native American spiritual practice. And so she's, she's, her environment is the earth. It's a squeak Carnwith in, Oak, in Oakland. She owns a three-story building. And uh, when I walked into Squeaks, she's, she's, I'm not really comfortable, I, you know, showing my face. I said, cover it up then. <laughs> so she covered it with a small painting, and I thought a blank canvas would be perfect. This is Pam Dixon. Pam Dixon the uh, naked elephant to her 
to her left is uh, Manuel Neri, the sculptor. And they were uh, an item, a love, of, a love affair many, many years ago. Pam is one of the most delightful people I've ever known, and she wound up being a conduit to Bay Area artists, women artists, that she thought I ought to photograph, and she helped me a lot. Guess who? Ruth Rapon. I never had her as a teacher, but I had her as a friend, and that was a lot. And this is, she's sitting with one of her sculptures at UC Davis Med Center. This is Heidi Beckabreed with her cuteware art in Davis. And uh, uh, she was fun to photograph, as you can tell. I mean, making a portrait is a, is a partnership. Uh, if, if, if you're not willing, if the subject isn't willing to be a partner in the process, you're not going to get a good portrait. It's just not going to happen. Uh, I mean, you have to have a lot of respect. And you know, I can always sneak up on somebody and take a snapshot, but that's not this. But I love that portrait. This is Hung Lu. She also passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, she's painting from photographs by Dorothea Lang, which I thought was rather wonderful, from the Dust Bowl series and the WPA times. This is the last one in the show. I made this, pic I made this uh, image uh, last week after coming back from Fort Bragg. And the, the uh, cypress trees that you see there, that grove, uh, was what we got to stare at out our window from the motel where we stayed. And I've stayed there a number of times. And the raven I photographed off of the uh, Mendocino headlands, but obviously it's a Photoshop and playing with things. But that's what I brought for you. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, I, let me say one thing. If, if you, anybody wants to get in touch with me, my website is fishbackphotography.com. OK, and you can get, if you want to see more, more importantly, because uh, there's a lot of images on that website. And there's, you left some business cards out on the table yes. as, as you came in. Yeah, feel free to take one of those business cards okay. if you're interested in yakking about art and being mentored. I think he'd be a great mentor. Uh, so we've got time for, uh, time for some questions. Scott, Scott, so, the microphone. So we've got a mic. Any questions? Ra have raise any your questions hand if you'd like Kirk? to ask a question. Oh, right over here. Did I keep it under 45? Yes, you did. Good job. <laughs> so uh, is this on? It's on. OK. So to both um, Kurt and Cassandra, um, I, I don't have a question. I want to say thank you for all the years that you donated to the KVIE art auction. I, I was on the art auction co committee for about 30 years, and every year the two of you were there to donate. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Other questions? Questions? Oh, no. Anyone? Oh, here's oh, one. Here we, Scott here. down here. Get my exercise here. What kind of camera are you using now? Interesting that you should ask. I had a Canon 5D with a, a 15, 30 millimeter zoom lens on it. And I hadn't used it in a number of years. I had back surgery a couple of years ago where they fused L5 and S1. Anybody identify with that? Yeah, yeah OK. It, it slowed me down rather dramatically. And I got that camera out the other day, and it's too heavy. But what I've discovered is I'm experimenting now with, uh, with uh, my cell phone. And so I think a new camera will be the iPhone 15 or whatever newest iteration of that there is. I'm amazed that it has the same resolution as my Canon 5D that I bought in 2006. And uh, it's, not, it's not exactly the same pixel, kind of pixels. Uh, anybody do Photoshop? Yeah, you, you blow them up and you play games with them and you do sharpening. It doesn't react quite the same way as a, a real uh, CMOS capture device. And uh, so that's, 
Where am I going? I don't know. Maybe the next thing will be the new, uh, uh, there's a couple of new cameras that are quite, quite lightweight and they're like 48 megapixels. Okay. Any, Any more other questions? questions? You can ask here's, me anything. Here's a question down here. As you can tell, I'm not shy. And I got to sit down. <laughs> uh, my question just is, um, how do you think your photography was affected by your early work in, with pottery, with clay? Good question. That, that's an interesting question. Uh, the, the thing is, I know artist studios. And it's ironic, most people don't know I did ceramics. You know, they, they think, oh, well, he's, he's a photographer. That's all he is. And he just photographs other artists and so forth. That's not the case. But I think that um, I have such a strong, I care about other artists. And I care about the plight of being, I mean, I mean when you make art, you get lost in your own wonderful, wild, you know, mystical world. And it's delightful. Then you wake up and you've got to pay your bills. And you, you realize, oh my god. And so uh, uh, the one thing that got me the most prepared to do the portraits was my dad, who from the time I was a little kid, he says, one thing that you need to remember, and it will stand you in good stead, is that you are no better than anyone else, and no one else is better than you. He says, write that down somewhere. and." Remind yourself, read it once a week. Don't get a big fat head and an ego. Be, you know, in other words, he told me, he says, you got to be humble and caring because the people you're photographing have more problems than you do, probably. So that's, but, but yeah, I mean, when I'd, when I'd go into Bob Arneson's studio, that last portrait I did of him where he's by the self portrait bust, uh, we had just gone to dinner in Benicia. And we walk back in, and uh, oh, wow, that's, that's where to put you. And so Bob sat down, and I did a new portrait of him. I'd been working with him all afternoon. Another question, uh, Scott, in the middle there. I'm going to try and sneak in a two-parter here. If you still use film photography, what influences which technology you use? And if you don't use film photography, what do you miss about it? I'll tell you what I miss about it. If you shoot a digital file now, and any part of the exposure goes into the white range, there's nothing there. But a negative, on a negative, I can print up to two to three f-stops of information. By, I mean, I, taught to dodge, I was taught to dodge and burn and use dodging tools and farmer's reducer to bleach back uh, highlights and so forth. And if I had to start over now, I would build a dark room, I would shoot film, and I would then get a high-end scanner, and I would do everything else digitally. Because that portrait of Robert Mapplethorpe took me three hours every time I made a print to dust spot. And my mother took retouching from William Mortensen back in the 30s, uh, late 30s, early 40s, down, down in LA, and taught me how to do that kind of retouching. But you sit there with a triple odd brush, and, and I just had a corneal transplant in this eye two years ago. And I can see now really well. <laughs> uh, but you know, to have to dust spot for three hours, Ansel Adams had a full-time retoucher doing his dust spotting. So uh, as far as the technology, uh, I'm on the freestyle uh, photography board down in Hollywood and so forth. And uh, if I need to film, I just call them and say, what's the best fine grain film that with some speed to it? And, and you know what film taught me? Film taught me to be really patient because 99% of the exposures that I made were at one second or, or longer half second to second and a half. Because why? I wanted everything in focus from front to back. I would focus for full depth of field because if I'm using their environment, I didn't want selective focus to put anything out of focus because then that didn't define them. 
you make, put things out of focus to make them not interesting. Although some people think they're really being artful by making totally fuzzy pictures. I, I, I kind of wonder about that. But I, that's the choice I made. And that put it at F16, and that made it at one second on Tri-X. Other question? There's another question. Scott, there, can you see? Okay. Uh, you said we could ask anything. Sure. I was wondering if you listen to music when you're in your studio, and if you do, does it kind of depend on your mood, what you pick? Uh, when I, when I, <coughs> I uh, when I sit in the studio, I like to listen to Native American, now, I like to listen to Native American flute music, Japanese bamboo flute music, and uh, Tibetan chant, Buddhist chanting, uh, all kind, you know, some stuff that puts me in a meditative mood. When I had a dark room, uh, it was, uh, we had jazz stations. When I was in Utah, there was a jazz station, FM station, dedicated to jazz. And I, just, I could just sit and listen to, you know, uh, the, the best straight ahead jazz. Because my best friends in high school were people like Mel Martin, who wound up being one of the best tenor sax players in the world. Uh, I grew up with that, and actually grew up with opera and classical music and studying piano. But I couldn't hear as much as I could see. We have a question here, Kurt. Yeah, um, street photography is one of my favorites. I certainly haven't kept up with it, but are there other um, up-and-coming street photographers whose names you could float? I, I wish I could say I do know them, but I don't. I've been out of the mix for a while, and uh, when I was teaching, I stopped teaching at Sac American River College in uh, 2011. They budget cutted me out, uh, you know, it's, it happens. And uh, uh, my documentary class wound up having a show of uh, nice stuff. I, but I, uh, there's one guy who lives in Chico is still doing some photography. But I, I, I'm remiss to be connected with, with young people. And that saddens me, because I taught for over 40 years. I miss it. OK, any other questions? Here's one more down front. Uh, another father and son team. I took uh, introduction to black and white at uh, Sacramento State in about 1971 from Nick from DeLucia. Oh, yeah. Son Andy, did you know them at all? I taught at City College for, for them for a while. I taught at uh, City College and uh, American River at the same time starting in 19... Uh, Let's see. This see, was 1999. It was. I taught for about 10 years with him, and then I decided, since I lived in Antelope, uh, if I could get another class at American River College, I wouldn't have to commute into into, into the city. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, yeah, I was uh, good friends with with Andy Delucia and Dick Fleming. Yeah. Thank but you. they also they also mm -hmm. refused to call photography art. They were ducky, they were uh, uh, news photographers, and it was the, the sad thing is, it's difficult to make a living as a photographer now, very difficult. And I found the last years I taught at American River College, I couldn't I couldn't lie and and you know teach the business and photography class as though uh, as though they were actually going to make a living at it. It was it was just too difficult. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Kurt. Great. <laughs>